So I will um, be discussing congenital heart disease tonight, um, just because it's one of my favorite topics. I think it's really interesting. A lot of similarities and differences between veterinary medicine and, and humans as well. Uh, so hopefully the talk kind of gives you more information and also is just a lot of cool pictures and videos to look at as well. So to get started, just a, a disclaimer, a lot of the images in this PowerPoint I don't own. They're from a lot of different veterinary journals and um, different publications, and so they're not meant to be reproduced or anything like that. They're just strictly for teaching purposes. So to start off, the first congenital defect we'll go over is uh, patent ductus arteriosus, or PDA. That is the most common congenital defect uh, we see in dogs in veterinary medicine. So what is a patent ductus arteriosus? So going back to um, anatomy, the ductus arteriosus right here is a normal fetal structure that connects the pulmonary artery to the aorta. And normally that allows for blood to bypass the lungs when you're developing in utero, since you're not breathing. And as soon as an animal or person is born, that ductus is supposed to close down. If it does not close down, if it remains open, it's then called a patent ductus arteriosus or a PDA. So like I said, it's one of the most common congenital defects we see in veterinary medicine. Um, all of days, we're actually seeing multiple cases in one day. It is more common in females compar compared to males, but we see it in both. And it can affect any breed, but there is thought to be a heritable component in some smaller breeds of dogs. Some breeds we commonly see PDAs in are Maltese, Pomeranians, Little Yorkies, uh, miniature poodles, but we really can see it in any, any breed of dog. So what happens is after birth, the pulmonary arterial pressures decrease and the systemic pressures increase. So then what happens if the ductus arteriosus remains patent is blood flows from the aorta across the PDA into the pulmonary artery with each heartbeat. The blood then goes back to the lungs, back to the left side of the heart and over and over again in that, in that circuit. Over time, that results in a volume overload to the left side of the heart and so the left side of the heart can become dilated or enlarged. The left side of the heart then also has to work harder to meet the demands of the body because part of the blood flow that's pumping up to the rest of the body is not going out to the rest of the body, it's going back to the lungs. And eventually in most dogs, if the PDA is not closed and they develop progressive left-sided dilation, eventually they will develop left-sided congestive heart failure. So diagnosis, signalment, like I said, females, we see females more than males, so we can see it in both. A lot of times when they come in, there are clinical signs owners will report. It can be exercise intolerance. Sometimes they'll have coughing. If they have any signs of congestive heart failure, then they'll have increased respiratory rate or effort. But a lot of these dogs can actually uh, be normal or they, they don't think there are any uh, clinical signs. So we commonly um, hear is that people just think their puppy is a very well-behaved puppy and it's nice and calm and quiet and they just have no idea that their little puppy is is broken but a lot of people don't notice any outward clinical signs in them on physical exam you hear a left basilar continuous murmur so that's kind of the uh, washing machine murmur that they teach you about that's um, a diagnostic for a PDA. There's really very few things that can cause that kind of murmur. So if you hear a continuous murmur loudest at the left base of the heart, really it's a PDA until proven otherwise. And it's also important to remember that it is at the left base, so up under their left arm. So sometimes they have just a systolic murmur that you can hear at the left apex. So it's always important to get up under their left arm to listen at the base of the heart to, to hear for that continuous um, component of the murmur. In cats, actually, they're a little bit different. We don't see um, PDAs as often in cats, but when we do see PDAs in cats, they, they don't have the typical washing machine or continuous murmur. More often, theirs is just a long systolic murmur that can be difficult to differentiate that when their heart rate's over 200 and it's, it's so fast, but they're a little bit different than dogs. Another finding that we often uh, find on physical exam is that they have hyperkinetic uh, femoral pulses. So their femoral pulses are really strong, but very quick. And that's due to the, they have an increased cardiac output initially, but then it runs off into the ductus. And so it results in a very uh, strong pulse pressure initially, but it's very short lived. 
So this is a trans esophageal echo of a PDA. So what we can do, there's echo probes that you can put down the esophagus in an anesthetized animal. And it just gives you a more clear picture of the heart. They're very pretty, pretty images. So I thought this image was very nice to show you what the ductus actually looks like. So here's the aorta up here. This is a pulmonary drunk trunk down here. And then you can see this is the PDA that's connecting the two. And here's the continuous, all that bright, Yellow blue is the continuous turbulent flow coming from the aorta into the pulmonary trunk. So the treatment and in on all of these congenital defects, the diagnosis is really made based on echo. So I don't go over uh, how you diagnose it. The definitive diagnosis is, is on echo. Um, but then the treatment of a PDA, we recommend that all of them be closed as soon as possible. Occasionally, we will have dogs that live with PDAs their whole life or for, you know, for a long time and don't go into heart failure. However, that's very difficult to predict. And it's the one defect we can actually cure and completely fix with surgery. So we recommend all get closed as soon as possible um, to prevent any long-term effects. Other treatments, sometimes we will start them on medications depending on the degree of, of left-sided changes. So if they have severe left atrial or ventricular dilation, then sometimes we will start them on pemobendin or enalapril um, until they can have the PDA closed. We want to help prolong the time until they go into heart failure if for some reason surgery can't be performed right away. And it also uh, makes them a better anesthetic candidate. So that's kind of a case by case basis, whether we use uh, pemobendin or enalapril in these dogs before surgery, depending on how severe their left-sided dilation is. And if we do have a dog that comes in already in left heart failure, then we'll of course add furosemide as well. So those dogs we would start on pemobendin, enalapril, and furosemide and stabilize their congestive heart failure first and then go ahead and do surgery to close the PDA. So for closure of the PDA, there are really two main options that they, they can do, surgical or interventional closure. So for surgical closure, that's what uh, ideally a board certified surgeon would do, um, where it's a lateral thoracotomy and they tie off the ductus from the outside. The pros to that is it's not limited to patient size. So they can do any, any size dog. I have a couple two, two kilogram dogs that are going to surgery soon that I, I don't know how the surgeons do it, but they're teeny tiny. Another pro is at the cost. It, Surgical closure is generally a little bit cheaper than interventional closure. At NVS, typically we quote them about 3,500 for surgical closure, which is, is really not bad for the how intense the surgery is. Some cons to surgical closure are that it is more invasive, so it does require a lateral thoracotomy um, versus just a little incision into a vessel. And if they're really young animals, uh, personally, I find that they usually recover quite well from it anyway, but it is more invasive surgery. And then, of course, the most important uh, potential complication of surgical closure is fatal hemorrhage. So the canine ductus specifically is actually pretty fragile. It's a little bit different than what they see in people. Um, and so the ductus is very fragile. And so when they're dissecting around the ductus, if they accidentally tear or rupture the ductus, then they can bleed out. Um, and it's usually fatal. Occasionally they can stop the bleeding and, and they'll be okay, but a lot of times it ends up being fatal. So again, that's a very important complication. For interventional closure, that's what um, cardiologists do. And I'll kind of go over how we close it interventionally since that's my, my thing. Um, but some pros are it's a lot less invasive. So it's just a little incision on the inside of their uh, thigh compared to a lateral thoracotomy. The complications are less catastrophic, so you can have complications um, from interventional closure, mainly complications with the little incision site. Um, if they have even my own, one of my personal dogs had a PDA and I closed it and got a little um, excessive with the sutures I used to ligate her from an artery. And uh, because I put too many sutures in there, she had a little um, reaction, suture reaction. So uh, small complications like that. The cons to the interventional closure is cost. The interventional closure tends to be uh, more expensive. At UT, when I was in my residency there, it was about four to $6,000. So it does tend to be 
more expensive than surgical closure. And part of that is because the device we use to close it is, is pricey. Another uh, well, limitation to interventional closure is patient size. So um, typically we say patients um, have to be about over five kilograms, but it really depends on the size of the femoral arteries. So the catheters that we use for interventional closure, really if they're less than five kgs, their femoral arteries are not big enough to um, allow those catheters to, to pass through them. So all these really small patients, we see little miniature poodles or tiny Pomeranians that are, are puppies aren't, may not even get to five kgs if they are fully grown. Those all have to go to surgery. And then the last uh, thing that can prohibit interventional closure is um, the ductal morphology, which we'll go over. So these are all different illustrations of canine ductal morphology. So it can, it can vary and there's you know, even some other differences that can be seen, but this is kind of the main four classifications. So this one's actually not even fully patent, uh, the type one. So you can see where this is the, so this is the A order right here and the ductus comes off, but it never actually, it closes before it enters into the pulmonary artery. So that's called a ductal diverticulum and that's not gonna cause the animal any problems. Really, we just happen to find them sometimes if we're doing an angiogram. So you can see right here, but it doesn't go into the pulmonary artery. And then type two, you have two A and two B, or where the ductus tapers before it enters into the pulmonary artery. So you can see here, the ductus comes off the aorta and it's pretty uniform and dilated and then it abruptly tapers right before it goes into the pulmonary artery. For the type 2B, it's more of a funnel shape, so it gradually tapers, and then it has a sudden narrowing right before it enters the pulmonary artery. And then type 3 is just a big tubular ductus, so it doesn't taper at all. And that's important when I show you the device we use to close the ductus. It has to be one of the type 2 morphology, so it has to have a little ridge of tissue um, like this for the ACDO, the device, to lodge in. If it's a tubular ductus like this, there's really nothing to lodge that device on. And so type three ductus, a ducta can't be closed um, interventionally. So for interventional closure, the main device we use is an Amp Amplatz canine ductal occluder or ACDO. They used to use coils, um, but those aren't, aren't done as often anymore. They're just not as, um, the effective. So the Amplex canine ductal occluder is what's used most commonly now. And that device was made specifically for the canine ductal anatomy. Amplex is a company that has, uh, makes a lot of different interventional uh, cardiac devices for people. And this one is specifically for the canine ductus. So what it is, is it's composed of a nitinol mesh. I'll show you on the next slide. Um, it has a flat disc that fits in the pulmonary artery. And then the distal disc kind of looks like an umbrella sits in the ductus ampulla or the main part of the ductus. And so it occludes flow from the inside. So this is the ACDO or the Amplatz canine ductal occluder. So again, this is the flat distal disc. This part sits in the pulmonary artery. And then you have this little space. So that's where that rigid tissue um, or the ledge of tissue sits. And then this little umbrella part sits inside the, the ductus itself. And we deliver it with these catheters. You can see the catheter on the end here. And then the catheters just unscrew. And this device stays in the, in the patient. So here are some images from when we're doing interventional closure. Everything's done under fluoroscopy or live x-ray. Um, and we do an angiogram beforehand to highlight the ductal anatomy. So this image is just showing you, this is the pigtail catheter that's in the aorta that delivers the, the contrast to do the angiogram. So you can see the aorta is highlighted and then here is the ductus highlighted nicely. And then this right here is the pulmonary artery. And so when we do this, we do the angiogram and then we measure the minimal ductal diameter or the narrowest point of the ductus before it enters the PDA. So we make this measurement on the fluoroscopy unit and that determines what size then of ACDO we use. So there's different sizes, it all depends on this little measurement right here. So this shows you what the ACDO looks like when it's lodged in place. So like I said, this flat distal disc, you advance into the pulmonary artery and you kind of pull it back until it's flush against the wall of the pulmonary artery. And then this ledge of tissue sits in the middle and then that little umbrella part sits in the main um, ampulla or the, the main part of the ductus arteriosus. 
And so this was what it looks like in a patient after the fact. So if we did surgery in a patient, you know, if you ever do radiographs and see this, it might be a little shocking at first, but um, that duct, that ACDO just stays there um, for the rest of the, the patient's life. So this is just an image from a fluoroscopy from when we did a surgery. So this shows the ductus in place and it's still connected to the delivery catheter. And then we do another angiogram once it's in place to make sure that there's no more flow across the ductus before we unscrew it and leave that in place. So if you watch it again, you'll see that the contrast is injected into the, the ductus, but nothing goes into the pulmonary artery down here. So that ACDO is properly placed and is successfully occluding all blood flow through the patent ductus arteriosus. So that's really all on a normal straightforward PDA. So then we'll briefly mention a reversed PDA or a PDA that shunts right to left. We don't see it very commonly, but good to be aware of. And so a reverse PDA um, can occur for uh, from a few reasons. So one, it can have a chronic reversal. And so what can happen with a PDA, you get chronic overcirculation of the lungs. So you know, with every heartbeat again, some of that blood flow is going across the ductus to the pulmonary artery, back to the lungs, left heart over and over again. So the lungs see a lot of overcirculation and a lot of extra blood flow. And over time, that can lead to the development of pulmonary hypertension. If they develop pulmonary hypertension, once the right-sided pressures or the pulmonary pressures increase more than the left side, then the shunt reverses. So the shunt blood flows based on pressure gradient. So if the right-sided pressures are more than the left-sided pressures, then the blood will go in the reverse direction. You can also have an acute reversal of the shunt, and that's basically where the animal develops an acute um, onset of pulmonary hypertension. And there have been some reports where um, dogs can develop a acute necrotizing arteritis that causes an acute elevation in pulmonary, or in pulmonary pressures, which causes it to reverse. I actually had one of these cases in my residency. It was a dog we diagnosed with a PDA and they scheduled surgery for a few weeks later. Um, I think they were waiting for uh, to raise money or, or something, but they scheduled it for not even that long, a few weeks later. But um, in the meantime, unfortunately, the dog came in acutely dyspneic to the ER and we found that it had developed uh, acute pulmonary hypertension. And on the echo just a few weeks ago, there was no evidence of pulmonary hypertension at all. So that was an acute development and unfortunately caused the dog's PDA to um, reverse. You can also have where the, the shunts reversed from birth. And so like I said, normally when an animal or person's born, the pulmonary pressure should decrease uh, once they're born. And in some people or animals, the pulmonary pressure is never fully decreased. So it's called persistent pulmonary hypertension or persistent fetal circulation, where the pulmonary pressure is never appropriately decreased. And so in those cases, from the second the animal's born, the shunt's always flowing right to left. And so in these cases, unfortunately, the, the long-term prognosis is usually poor unless you can treat the pulmonary hypertension and, and reverse it back. Thankfully, in most cases of a normal PDA, so a left to right PDA, once you close, close it with surgery or interventional closure, uh, most of those dogs go on to live a normal lifespan. So this is my little dog, Kiwi, that, like I said, had a PDA. Um, she just turned four and is so far doing well. So it's, PDAs are one of my most favorite congenital defects because it's the only thing that I can actually ever fix. Um, nothing else in cardiology we ever fix and make better, but uh, these dogs, if it's just a PDA, you do surgery and fix it, then they're otherwise um, an essentially normal dog again. Um, so the reverse PDA, going back to that, so clinical signs, respiratory distress if it's acute. They can also develop hind limb weakness if it's a more chronic um, reversal. And on physical exam, uh, some changes, they can have differential cyanosis. And that's where their cranial mucous membranes are pink, but their caudal mucous membranes are cyanotic. And that's because if you look at this diagram, where the ductus comes off right here, and so if it's shunting right to left, you have your blood, co blood flow from your pulmonary artery to your lungs, where it gets oxygen, but some of that unoxygenated blood is going across the ductus to the aorta. But the ductus inserts into the aorta right here, right where it starts going into the descending aorta. So you have a mix of deoxygenated and oxygenated blood going into the descending aorta to the caudal half of the body, resulting in some cyanotic 
uh, mucous membranes caudally. But cranially, you mainly you just have oxygenated blood coming back to the left side of the heart that goes out the ascending part of the aorta to the brachycephalic trunk to the cranial half of the body. So you have oxygenated blood cranially and then a mix of deoxygenated and oxygenated blood going caudally, resulting in the differential cyanosis. Um, on exam, when you have a reverse PDA, uh, you won't hear the continuous murmur. So when they reverse, you first lose the diastolic murmur. So you may just hear a continuous murmur, but a lot of these dogs don't have a murmur at all. And so um, these cases can be, you, you may not suspect it at first because you listen and they don't have a murmur. Um, but if they previously had a loud murmur, you know they had a loud murmur and all of a sudden it goes away. Um, these are one of those things that you want to think about. So reverse PDA, the diagnosis um, is doing something called a bubble study. And so on the echo itself, you don't see the nice continuous turbulent blood flow in the main pulmonary artery like you do for a regular left to right PDA. Um, so what we do is we inject, we agitate saline and we inject into a cephalic vein. And normally you can see the agitated saline creates these little micro bubbles you can see on the echo. Um, and normally you see those bubbles go into the right side of the heart. And in a normal animal, those bubbles then go to the lungs and they just get filtered out by the lungs. And you see very few go back to the left side of the heart or anything like that. And in a right to left shunt, what you do is you see the bubbles enter the right heart and then you see them go elsewhere. So if it's a um, right to left VSD, for example, you see it go right into the right left ventricle. For reverse PDA, what you see is you see the bubbles fill the right heart and then almost immediately you can see them in the abdominal aorta. If you go back to this picture, you can see where if you inject little bubbles, it goes in into the right heart and then you'll see it down here in the abdominal aorta. So that's usually how we, how we diagnose it. And then treatment, like I said, you can try treating the pulmonary hypertension with sildenafil. Unfortunately, if the shunt doesn't, if the pulmonary pressures don't decrease, then there's really nothing else you can do. You can't close it when it's shunting right to left. And if you are able to decrease the pulmonary pressures enough and the reverse, the shunt reverses back and goes left to right, then you can close it. So now on to pulmonic stenosis. So this is the second most common congenital defect we probably see in dogs. So with pulmonic stenosis, there are variable degrees of thickening and fusion of the pulmonic valve leaflets. So the pulmonic valve separates the pulmonary artery to the lungs. So variable degrees of thickening and fusion of those valve leaflets. Sometimes they can also have a hypoplastic annulus, meaning that the pulmonary artery itself is actually too small or narrowed. And there's different types of pulmonic stenosis described, mainly type A and type B morphology, but there is some overlap. So one is just that they're mainly stuck together, but the valves aren't that thickened. Um, so they're just kind of stuck and fused. And then the second type is that they're really thickened um, valve leaflets or very dysplastic looking valve leaflets, but there's a lot of overlap in, in dogs um, between those two. So what happens is normally when the right heart contracts, the pulmonic valve opens wide open. It's a wide open tube for blood to go forward to the lungs. And so in pulmonic stenosis, those valve leaflets are all stuck together and so they don't fully open. So it results in a smaller opening or a stenosis you can see right here for blood to flow through. So this is a nice open pulmonic valve and this is a very narrowed opening. And what happens then is it makes it harder for the right side of the heart uh, to pump blood forward to the lungs to get oxygen. And so that's a pressure overload to the right heart. The right side of the heart then responds to a pressure overload by getting thickened or hypertrophied. So just like any muscle, if you're working out harder or the harder you're working, it's gonna get thickened. So they get right ventricular hypertrophy or thickening. And they can also sometimes get um, dilation of the right side, depending on if they also have a pulmonic regurgitation and or tricuspid regurgitation. So if they also have tricuspid dysplasia with tricuspid regurgitation, then they can get concurrent dilation of the right heart in addition to the hypertrophy. Over time in severe cases, um, that can result in, they can develop a few complications from the pulmonic stenosis. One of the most common is they can eventually develop right-sided congestive heart failure, which in dogs most commonly results in ascites. 
They can also develop arrhythmias, specifically ventricular arrhythmias, as they develop right ventricular hypertrophy that predisposes them to arrhythmias um, due to the increase in, in oxygen demand of the heart muscle. They can also have syncope, whether that's from arrhythmias or just exertional syncope because they're not able to get that blood flow to their lungs to get oxygen. And then they can uh, experience sudden death. Uh, thankfully, that's a lot less common compared to other defects like subaortic stenosis that we'll go over. So pulmonic stenosis is mostly considered a, a sporadic defect versus hereditary. So if you have a breeder, for example, that has a litter and they have a dog with pulmonic stenosis, if it's the first time, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's um, from bad breeding from their parents. And so uh, we obviously don't want to breed the animal that has a defect, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they can't breed the dam and sire again. Pulmonic stenosis is seen more commonly in certain breeds though. So uh, English Bulldogs are very common, French Bulldogs, miniature Schnauzers, Boxers, and Terrier breeds. So um, those are kind of the most common uh, dogs we see. And I also see a lot of um, pit bulls, which I guess are Terrier breed. A lot of pit mixes and pit bulls I see uh, pulmonic stenosis in. But I've also seen them in little cav cavies, Cavalier King Charles Spaniels and, and other things. So clinical signs, um, a lot, sometimes they can have syncope with excitement or exercise. But again, a lot of these dogs, especially if they're puppies, might not have any, any signs. So again, these may not, the owners may not know there's anything wrong with them. And the only reason we are suspicious of something like pulmonic stenosis is because of their physical exam. And on their exam, the, the finding would be a left basilar systolic murmur. Remember the pulmonic valve and the aortic valve are both heard at the left base, so up under the left arm. So that's where you're going to hear the murmur the loudest, and it's just systolic. Some other findings, if they're in right heart failure, of course, you can have abdominal stension if they have ascites. You can also see jugular pulses if they're in right heart failure. So again, the diagnosis, like all these conditions, diagnosis is going to be on echo. And on the echo, um, some of the things we look at are one, the pressure gradient across the pulmonic valve, and that tells us how severe the pulmonic stenosis is. So we classify pulmonic stenosis into mild, moderate, and severe, and that's based on the, the gradient that we measure across the pulmonic valve. So a mild case is a gradient of 30 to 50, moderate is 50 to 80, and then anything over 80 to 100 is considered severe. And these classifications are derived from people. That's the same cutoff they use in people. The other changes we look for on echo are the degree of right ventricular hypertrophy or thickening. We also look to see if they have any tr a concurrent tricuspid regurgitation. We can see dilation of the main pulmonary artery, we call post-stenotic dilation. And then we also look to see if the pulmonary annulus itself is hypoplastic. So if the pulmonary artery itself is too narrow. So here are some echo images. So this is the aorta, right ventricle going into the main pulmonary artery. This is the pulmonic valve. And so you can see that the leaflets are kind of thickened. Normally they just look like a thin line, like a seagull's wings or something. Um, so these are thickened pulmonic valve leaflets. This is a dog with a hypoplastic uh, pulmonary annulus. So Normally the aorta and the pulmonary artery should have about equal diameter. So the diameter of the aorta and the pulmonary artery should be about equal. And you can see in this image, here's the aortic diameter, and you can see that the pulmonary artery is much more narrow. So that is, um, pul the pulmonic annulus is hypoplastic. And this is a good example of what uh, post-stenotic dilation looks like. So. Um, sometimes that blood flow across the pulmonic valve uh, does so with a high velocity and it kind of sprays out. It's kind of like if you put your finger on the end of a hose and then the water shoots out. That's what the, the blood flow does and so it causes dilation after the stenosis or after the narrowing. So they get post-stenotic dilation of their main pulmonary artery. And then this image shows the uh, degree of right ventricular hypertrophy or thickening. So this is the left atrium left ventricle, right atrium, right ventricle. And normally the right side is about a third of the left side. So here's the left free wall, this is interventricular septum, and this is the right free wall. 
and you can see this right free wall is thicker than the left side of left walls. So that dog has right ventricular hypertrophy or thickening. So treatment for dogs with pulmonic stenosis. Um, if they're moderate to severe cases, they're usually started on a beta blocker, most commonly at Tenalol. And the beta blocker does a few things. M main reason we use it is it decreases their heart rate and decreases the contractility of their heart, both of which decrease the myocardial oxygen demand or how much oxygen the heart muscle needs. And that helps to reduce the risk of arrhythmias and things like that. Uh, occasionally, we can also see that the pressure gradient decreases on a beta blocker. Usually that's more of um, because we're decreasing the contractility, there's less force, um, uh, contractility against uh, forcing the blood out across the pulmonic valve. And so it's not really a true reduction. It's not decreasing the severity of the stenosis. It's just uh, because of how we're affecting the contractility that it causes the pressure gradient to decrease. Then in severe cases, we recommend a procedure called a balloon valvuloplasty. So like I said, it's uh, recommend severe cases. Unfortunately, this procedure, unlike a PDA, it's not actually fixing the valve. So the goal is not to fix the valve and make it normal, but rather the goal is to just decrease the gradient by 50% to try to decrease the severity of it, to try to prolong the animal's um, survival or prolong their um, or improve their prognosis. So it's not fixing it, which is very important that owners know it's not fixing it, it's just trying to decrease how severe it is. Some limitations to uh, do this procedure. And one is the hypoplastic annulus. If they have a hypoplastic annulus, then doing the balloon is not necessarily going to help them because we're not making the pulmonary artery itself any bigger. So if they have a hypoplastic annulus, the, the uh, balloon valvuloplasty is not going to be as helpful. Uh, something else, another reason we can't do this procedure is if they have an aberrant coronary artery, which we'll go over shortly. And then uh, patient size. Most of the time it's not as a concern, as much of a concern as with PDAs. Uh, for this procedure, we go down their jugular vein. And so most of the time we can do this procedure even, even in small dogs. Interestingly, we did, I did do a procedure a balloon valvuloplasty in an alpaca once, and that was difficult almost because the alpaca was too big, its, its neck was too long. We were able to do it, but it was a little bit challenging because its neck was so much longer to get to its heart compared to a, a dog. So talking about uh, aberrant coronary arteries, um, this is one of the main things that precludes us to be able to do the balloon valvuloplasty. And so normal coronary artery anatomy um, so if you look at your aorta right here, you normally have a right coronary artery that comes off the right side and then feeds the, the right side of the heart. And then you have a left coronary artery that comes off the left side and then it branches to feed the left side of the heart. So your coronary arteries are the main vessels that are providing the heart muscle itself with blood flow. And so if they have an aberrant or abnormal coronary artery, sometimes we can't do the, the balloon valvuloplasty procedure. And specifically, we're worried if there's a coronary artery crossing over the pulmonic valve. So one of the first abnormalities that was documented was what was called an R2A coronary anomaly. And so what that is, is this picture down here, you have your aorta and you have a single right coronary artery coming off the right side. And then the left coronary artery branches off of the right, but it still has to get to the left side of the heart. So in order to do that, it has to cross over the pulmonic annulus. So it kind of goes around the pulmonary artery to get to the left side of the heart. And what happens then is it's kind of constricting around the pulmonary artery or the pulmonic valve. And so if you go in and balloon that and stretch that area, you could rupture that coronary artery. And it was forced, this R2A was first uh, described or most described in English Bulldogs. They're kind of the poster child for having these abnormal coronary arteries, but we can see it in any breed. So here's another image of what that would look like. So um, on this image, this is the aorta right here. And this is the pulmonary artery or the pulmonic valve. And so in this case, there's actually a single left coronary artery. So you see the left coronary artery coming off and then it branches into your left circumflex and anterior descending. And then your right coronary artery is coming off the left side. And so it's still, the right has to get 
to the right side. So it crosses around the pulmonic valve to get to the right side of the heart. So like I said, the R2A, oh, I showed in the previous slide, was what was originally reported um, most commonly, but now that they, we, we do these cases more often and with advanced imaging like fluoroscopy and CT scans, they're finding more and more coronary abnormalities. So um, it doesn't really matter which type of coronary anomaly it is, if any of them are crossing over the area of the pulmonic valve, then we cannot do this procedure. So here's another image from an angiogram. And so um, these are kind of side-by-side -side images, but uh, this right here, this dark is the um, contrast highlighting the right side of the heart. So this is the right ventricle and then pulmonary artery. And you can see the post stenotic dilation right here. And then there's also a coronary angiogram showing the coronary anatomy. So here's the left coronary artery, left circumflex going off. And you can see this right one that's going around the area of the pulmonic valve. So when we're doing these um, procedures, we always do an angiogram beforehand and we look at the coronary arteries. And if we see any abnormalities or any coronary arteries kind of crossing over the area of the pulmonic valve, then we don't do the procedure. For the balloon valvuloplasty, like I just said, the first thing we do is an angiogram where we inject contrast into the heart to assess for coronary anatomy. Um, sometimes on the echo, you can see those abnormal coronary arteries kind of crossing over the area of the pulmonic valve, um, but not all the time. And so we don't always rule it out on echo. And so you have to do the angiogram once they're under anesthesia to definitively rule in or out a, an aberrant coronary artery. So before any balloon valvuloplasty, we always do that, whether it's a common breed like bulldog or not. Um, you can also do CT scans depending on the, the CT scan scanner you have, but uh, most of the time it's just an angiogram. When we do the angiogram, we also measure the pulmonic annulus and that uh, determines the balloon size we use. For the procedure, we have these balloon tip catheters that look like this. And we basically cross them over the area of the pulmonic valve and inflate them. And it essentially rips the pulmonic valve leaflets apart to try to make a bigger opening uh, for blood to flow through. And so we measure their pulmonic annulus size, and then that determines, we use that annulus size to calculate the size of balloon um, we use. Here is an angiogram, just another example of what we see when we do the angiogram under fluoroscopy. So this is the pigtail catheter that's in the right ventricle, and that's what's delivering the contrast agent. And so you'll see the contrast first goes into the right ventricle, and then you can see the pulmonic valve and it goes out the pulmonary artery. So one thing you'll notice is that the right ventricle is hypertrophied, so you see a lot of heart muscle. Another thing you notice is that the pulmonic valve leaflets here, you can see very well. And so that's what it typically looks like with stenosis is you just kind of have a filling defect right here where the pulmonic valve is. And then you have this nice post stenotic dilation of the main pulmonary artery. And so we use this image. This is a perfect image that we would um, measure the pulmonic annulus right here. So we kind of jokingly say a little butt cheeks. Um, so that's where we'd measure from um, to determine the size of balloon we would need. This illustration shows again what we do for the balloon valvuloplasty. So we're going down the jugular vein into the right heart, and then we loop around out the right ventricular outflow tract. And we place that balloon across the pulmonic valve, and then we inflate it to essentially rip those valve leaflets apart. So here is an image from a balloon valvuloplasty of us doing the, the procedure. I'll play it a few times. And so this catheter is coming down the jugular vein into the right side of the heart, and this balloon is crossing the area of the pulmonic valve. So what you'll see as we gradually inflate, and we inflate it with the contrast so you can see it, as we inflate it, you'll see a little narrowing in the balloon, and that's where the pulmonic valve leaflets are. So right about here, you see it a little narrowed, and then you keep inflating until you see that waste in the, the um, balloon disappear, meaning that you essentially ripped those leaflets apart. So we'll watch it again. So again, you're looking right here where it's narrowed, there's the leaflets, and you keep inflating until it pops them open. It's pretty satisfying when you're doing the procedure and you see them pop open like that. And I don't know if you can kind of tell by the way the heart's beating, but um, yeah, they often do have some arrhythmias when you're doing that procedure because when you're inflating the balloon, you're essentially blocking all blood flow through the heart. And so they temporarily get very angry 
Um, and so they commonly have arrhythmias, but they usually are self-resolving or they respond very well to treatment under anesthesia. And so that's uh, pulmonic stenosis. And the balloon valvuloplasty, again, main things being that the goal is just to decrease the severity to uh, prolong their, their survival, but it's not actually fixing the defect. But that's the best thing we have for severe cases. So moving on to subaortic stenosis, or SAS. So subaortic stenosis um, and subaortic stenosis, it's not the aortic valve itself, but rather it's a ridge of tissue that forms below the aortic valve um, that results in a narrowed opening for blood to, to leave the left side of the heart. So you can see in this image right here, this, what's kind of this black stuff on this illustration is this ridge of tissue that's forming below the aortic valve this resulting in a narrowed opening for blood to, to go through. And this is one of the, so all the congenital defects we're talking about are things that animals are, are born with. Subaortic stenosis is unique in that they are born with the uh, genetics or the propensity to form that subvalvular ridge of tissue, but that ridge of tissue can actually continue to grow until they're fully grown. So these are one of the, this is the only real defect where it may not, um, truly be there, that ridge of tissue may not be there when they're born or when they're four or six weeks old or, or what have you, but then as they continue to grow, that ridge can continue to, fo to form. So what happens, just like pulmonic stenosis, with a narrowed opening for blood to go through, it makes it harder for the, right, for the left side of the heart to pump blood out to the rest of the body, and so it results in a pressure overload to the left side of the heart. The left heart then responds, like I said, any muscle that's working harder by getting hypertrophied or thickened. And eventually dogs with subaortic stenosis can develop the similar complications to pulmonic stenosis with the exception of one. So one, they can develop arrhythmias as they develop left ventricular hypertrophy. Um, they can experience sudden death. And for whatever reason, for subaortic stenosis, they tend to die suddenly more than pulmonic stenosis. They can also develop left-sided congestive heart failure, especially if they have concurrent mitral regurgitation. And another unique thing about subaortic stenosis is that it's the only heart disease that predisposes dogs to um, endocarditis or infection of the, the aortic valve. And so this is the only disease that predisposes to endocarditis. So in this image, you can see this kind of fibrous ridge of tissue below the aortic valve. So here's the aortic valve right here. And this is the thick ridge of tissue below it. Subaortic stenosis is hereditary in certain breeds. I mean, it's genetic. So it is inherited as an autosomal dominant trait in golden retrievers in Newfoundlands. So this is one that is very important for breeding. If an animal has subaortic stenosis, we definitely don't want them to breed because they will pass it on. Um, and if an animal has subaortic stenosis, then it's a, if it's a golden or, or new fee, then it likely got it from one of its, its parents. And so sometimes if it's really mild, it may go undiagnosed and then, um, you know, they, they're bred, have a litter and they have, unfortunately, some of their offspring that have more severe cases. Some other breeds that we can see it in that haven't been proven to be hereditary are Rottweilers, German Shepherds, and Boxers. So in general, subaortic stenosis tends to be seen in more larger dogs. And there is genetic testing available for um, Newfoundlands through NC State University. And it's important to know that it doesn't diagnose subaortic stenosis. It's just uh, testing for the genetic mutation that they uh, could carry the defect. And so and it's really only useful to guide breeding. So if they, if you have two animals that test positive, you don't want to breed them together. So clinical signs, like I said, for most of them already, um, they often can be asymptomatic. So the owners have nothing, no, nothing's wrong with them. And they can also have syncope and uh, potentially exercise intolerance. So again, the main uh, reason we know that they have this or main suspicion for it is based on our physical exam and the finding of a left basilar systolic murmur. So the murmur is actually going to be pretty similar to, to pulmonic stenosis. So it's at the left base because again, uh, the left base is where the pulmonic and aortic valve both are. So up under the left arm and it's systolic. So if you have a loud left basilar systolic murmur in a dog, really you have to have both subaortic stenosis and pulmonic stenosis on your differentials until you do an echo and definitively diagnose it.
one thing that can be interesting with subaortic stenosis or that may increase your suspicion of subaortic stenosis over pulmonic stenosis is that uh, the murmur can increase in loudness as they grow. So like I talked about, and when they're born, they don't necessarily have that rigid tissue below the aortic valve. And that rigid tissue can continue to form or continue to grow as they continue to develop. And so when they're a puppy, they may not have a murmur at all if that rigid tissue is not there. And then as they get older, that rigid tissue becomes more and more prominent, which further worsens the stenosis and then creates a louder murmur. So this is one of the few cases where the murmur actually increases, um, can increase or get louder as they grow. So on echo, what we see is a subvalvular ridge of tissue. So this image shows it pretty nicely. So this is left atrium over here, left ventricle, and this is the aorta. And you see this ridge of tissue sticking out right under the aortic valve. This right here is the aortic valve. So there's this little ridge of tissue sticking out under the aortic valve. And you can see that's creating that turbulent blood flow, that bright yellow blue color. And so that's creating increased velocity, increased turbulent blood flow, which causes the, the murmur. And here's another image, again, just showing this ridge of tissue forming below the aortic valve. Because of that ridge of tissue, it then results in elevated velocities across the aortic valve. And then we can also see aortic regurgitation, not because there's an abnormality primarily with the aortic valve, but when that turbulent blood flow goes across that narrowing and hits the aortic valve, it, it often causes some degree of damage. And so they um, often have aortic regurgitation or a, a leaking of the aortic valve as well. And then we can assess on echo the degree of left ventricular hypertrophy or thickening um, when we do the echo. Here are some uh, radiographs of a, a dog with subaortic stenosis. And so uh, right here is the left atrium, which is dilated. And then this is the left ventricle. And you can see the contrast is in the lumen or the inside of the left ventricular chamber. And so you can actually kind of highlight the wall thickness of the left side. So the part that does not have contrast. And then you can see right here that there's a little narrowed opening for the contrast to go through before it gets to the aortic valve. So this is the aortic valve right here. And basically that ridge of tissue is where there's no contrast filling. There's a lack of filling. And then just like pulmonic stenosis, after the stenosis, you can have post stenotic dilation of the aorta. So similar to pulmonic stenosis where you have uh, post stenotic dilation of the main pulmonary artery, except for this one is the aorta. So his aorta, ascending aorta is nice and dilated. So treatment of subaortic stenosis, we also start them on a beta blocker, again, mainly to decrease how much oxygen the heart muscle needs to try to reduce the risk of arrhythmias, especially fatal arrhythmias in subaortic stenosis. And so typically we start with atenolol, um, but if they do develop any ventricular arrhythmias, then we usually switch them to sotolol. Uh, so atenolol is just a pure beta blocker. Sotolol is a beta blocker and a potassium channel blocker. So when they have ventricular arrhythmias, the sotolol is more helpful because of the potassium channel blocking effects, which decrease the ventricular arrhythmias. And so that's the main treatment is just a beta blocker. Unfortunately, subaortic stenosis is probably one of my least favorite defects because we don't really have a lot we can do for it. We're mainly just starting on a beta blocker and managing other symptoms or, or other consequences like the arrhythmias. Now, occasionally what can be done is called a cutting balloon valvuloplasty. And so this procedure is not routinely done in veterinary medicine. There are certain veterinary hospitals that are doing it. University of Florida is really where most of the research was being done. And I, I believe they're still doing the procedure, uh, but, but vast majority of um, definitely private practices aren't doing it and not very many academic institutions are doing it. Uh, but something to be aware of in case you have a owner that wants to, wants to do absolutely everything. And so with a cutting balloon valvuloplasty, um, the, the reason, I'll back up, the reason subaortic stenosis is not amenable to a standard balloon valvuloplasty is because it's not the pulmonic valve itself that's just stuck together and just needs to be opened up with a balloon. It's actually that fibrous ridge of tissue below the aortic valve. And so you can go in there with a balloon, but you're not really going to stretch or get rid of that fibrous ridge of tissue. And so they don't really respond to just a standard balloon valvuloplasty like pulmonic stenosis does. And so what a cutting balloon valvuloplasty is, um, is they have these um, balloon tip catheters that have these micro surgical blades. I don't know if you can see this gray part right here, but these are tiny little blades. that are supposed about 20 times sharper than a standard surgical blade. So very sharp blades. 
So what they do is they pass this um, balloon tip catheter into the left heart across the, that ridge of tissue and then they inflate this balloon which deploys these little blades and it essentially cuts, makes little cuts in that, those, that ridge of tissue. Um, and so you cut the ridge of tissue and then you can follow it with a regular balloon and then try to inflate that area, or try to stretch that ridge of tissue to make a bigger opening. It, it definitely sounds terrifying and I don't know if I'd want my own dog to have these little blades in their, in their heart, um, but they have done it in, in several dogs with uh, variable degrees of success. And what they found is that some dogs uh, don't respond at all to the balloon valvuloplasty, the cutting balloon valvuloplasty. And it seems that the dogs that do respond, um, it's based on what's called an aortoceptal angle. So on uh, imaging, what that the aortoceptal angle means is so you, you have your aorta here, aortic valve, and then you have your interventricular septum, um, which is the wall that separates your left, left and right heart. Whoops. And so that aortoceptal angle is the angle between those two where they, they intersect. And they found that uh, that angle, um, if they have an angle less than 160, that, that um, those dogs seem to respond better to the cutting balloon valvuloplasty. But there is certainly some um, overlap. So some of the dogs they've done this procedure in, um, they do well initially. And then, you know, six months down the road, that ridge of tissue forms back. Some of them do well. And so it's not as straightforward. Um, as, as the other procedures, um, but it is out there. In people, what they can also do, which we don't do in, in dogs, but people, they can actually go in surgically and remove that ridge of tissue um, and the heart muscle underneath it. So it's called a myectomy. So they actually remove the heart muscle itself that's forming that ridge of tissue and they seem to have better success with that. So moving on to a ventricular septal defect or VSD. So ventricular septal defects can be classified into four types. You can have an inlet ventricular or ventricular septal defect, which is often associated with an, an AV septal defect, which we'll talk about those a little bit later. You can also have a, a perimembranous ventricular septal defect, which is the most common type we see in dogs. And that uh, results in uh, fibrous continuity of the aortic and tricuspid valve. So that's just how we uh, classify the different types. You can also have what's called a juxta arterial VSD, which results in continuity between the aortic and pulmonic valves, and then you can have a muscular VSD. So I'll show you an illustration that kind of shows all those. So this is an inlet ventricular septal defect, or it's called an AV septal defect, which we'll go over in another um, separately. This is a perimembranous ventricular septal defect, so it's kind of right under the um, aortic valve, and this is a location, like I said, we see most commonly in dogs. This is a juxta arterial VSD. And then these are all different types of muscular VSDs. So in the main heart muscle. There was a question about if all these conditions would be treated the same way in cats. Um, so a PDA, yes. Uh, balloon valvuloplasty, if it's just straightforward pulmonic stenosis, then it would be, um, a, they could be considered a candidate for balloon valvuloplasty. We tend to, we don't see as much uh, pulmonic stenosis and subaortic stenosis in cats. Um, but if you did have just a straightforward pulmonic stenosis, um, then it, there's no reason they couldn't have a balloon valvuloplasty. For subaortic stenosis, we really don't see that um, in cats. Cats tend to have more um, aortic stenosis, primary aortic stenosis, but it's still very uncommon. So we would still start them on if they had an aortic stenosis, start them on um, a beta blocker, but uh, they wouldn't necessarily be a candidate for a cutting balloon or anything like that. So with the um, ventricular septal defect, like I said, perimembranous is the most common. Um, and with that, uh, what can happen is, so the, the blood's going to again go from the left ventricle across the perimembranous ventricular septal defect, which is right under the, the aortic and pulmonic valves, and goes into the right heart, but right under the pulmonary artery. So it mainly is just going out the pulmonary artery to the lungs, back to the left side of the heart and over and over again. So it's really the left side of the heart that ends up seeing the extra amount of blood volume. And so it results in um, a volume overload or excess blood in the left side of the heart. And over time can result in left-sided dilation. 
They can also develop uh, pulmonary overcirculation, just like a, a PDA. So any chronic left to right shunt can result in pulmonary overcirculation. And again, if that overcirculation results in pulmonary hypertension and the right-sided pressures increase, the shunt can reverse and go right to left. With perimembranous uh, defects, thankfully the most common type we see are what's also called restrictive. And so restrictive just means it's a very small hole. It restricts the amount of blood that's actually shunted across the hole. And so restrictive VSDs uh, generally don't uh, cause animals any clinical problems. So um, VSDs are probably one of my second most common or uh, most favorite control defects because they it's they have a control defect and it cre actually creates a very loud murmur, but so most of the time they actually do fine. So diagnosis, um, there's no specific breed or sex for VSDs. Uh, VSD is one of the most common in cats. And so um, like someone asked about in cats, we do see differences in congenital defects in terms of which ones are most common. So dogs most common are PDA and pulmonic stenosis. Uh, cats are a little bit different. And so VSDs are one of the most common uh, ones we see in cats. A lot of times, like I said, they don't have any clinical signs. If they do have a large VSD and have left volume overload, then they can have signs of uh, heart failure. And then if the shunt reverses, if it shunts right to left instead of left to right, then they have signs of cyanosis because uh, they're having less blood flow to the lungs and they're getting deoxygenated blood going out to the rest of the body. On physical exam, these animals actually have a right-sided murmur. And so you hear the murmur loudest on the right and it's just a systolic murmur. And the VSD is one, the one disease where the loudness of the murmur is actually inversely correlated with the disease severity. So the louder the murmur with the VSD, usually the better it is. And that's because you want, with a VSD, you want a very small hole, which limits the amount of blood flow across the VSD. A very small hole, though, results in a very high velocity of blood across it, and that high velocity results in a really loud murmur. So. The louder the murmur, the smaller the hole, the better the, the disease is for the animal. So on echo, you can see it uh, depends on what type of, of VSD you have. So this is an animal with a muscular VSD that's right at the apex of the heart. So this is left ventricle, right ventricle, and you can see this VSD at the very bottom of, of the heart. And this was in an alpaca. Um, camelids, alpacas, uh, for whatever reason, tend to have a lot of uh, congenital defects as well. Um, Oregon State has a lot of work with different alpacas and, and whatnot in various congenital defects. And then this is an example of the most common type we see, like I said, called a perimembranous ventricular septal defect. So it's seen right here at the very top of the septum. So this is the muscular septum and then the very tip top right under the aortic valve is the membranous part of the septum. And so that's where we see most uh, commonly we see VSDs. So you can see a little hole right here. And then on Doppler, uh, you can see that turbulent blood flow coming from the left into the right side. And sometimes these little holes, the VSDs, are so small you can't even just see it on plain echo. And so you really need Doppler to be able to see if there's any blood flow across the septum because sometimes the holes are really, really tiny. And so you really need Doppler to be able to um, definitively rule in or out a, a VSD. And then here's just another um, example. So again, left side of the heart, aorta, and you can see this opening right here is the VSD. So treatment for ventricular septal defects, if it's restrictive, again, if the hole is really small, then no treatment is necessarily needed. Um, and we just monitor with regular echoes um, over time, sometimes yearly, every, sometimes every other year, depending on how stable they are. If the VSD is hemodynamically significant, so if the VSD is large enough that it's resulting in volume overload to the left side of the heart, then we treat it uh, with medications, pemobendin and enalapril, like any left overload, like a valve disease dog or DCM. If they end up going into left side of heart failure, then you can also, then we would add in furosemide. And if it is very big, we can also consider surgical or interventional closure in certain cases. It really depends on the location of the VSD, whether it's amenable to interventional closure or not. And then surgical closure usually requires bypass, which is not available at most places.
And so this is a, a dog that had a muscular D VSD, which again is not very common, um, but if we see that, the muscular VSDs are in a location that does allow us to close them interventionally. And the device is similar to what we do for PDAs. It's a, it's a Amplot secluder. This one specifically is actually made for people, but you can see it has a disc on each side that sits on each side of the septum. So this is on echo after it's in place. So the VSD was right here, and this occluder is kind of spanning the defect, and then it has a, the um, flat disc on either side of the defect holding that device in place. And then this is what it looked like on radiographs. And this was a dog, I believe they did it at Ohio State when Dr. Skansen was still there, but uh, not very common that we see muscular VSDs. Uh, the most common type, like I've talked about, the perimembranous ventricular septal defects. Unfortunately, a lot of times we can't close those with any device because the defects are right under the aortic valve. And so I can show you, go back to this image. So here's the aortic valve and here's this defect. So if we tried to put some kind of device there that had like some kind of disc, flat disc that had a lodge on this side, uh, that could really interfere with the aortic valve itself. And so a lot of times these, uh, in this location, um, it's not really amenable to any interventional closure. Moving on to atrial septal defect or ASD. So we really have two main types of um, atrial septal defects, a primum, ASD is in the ventral or the lower part of the septum, just above the tricuspid valve. And that's also called a partial AV septal defect. And then a secundum ASD is in the middle of the atrial septum, where you would, uh, the area of the fossoavallus, if you remember that back from anatomy. And it's important to know that a secundum ASD is different than a patent foramen ovale. So one thing we didn't talk about with pulmonic stenosis is normally you have a frame in a valley or a little opening in the atrial septum and that flap, there, it's like a flap of tissue that closes down once you're born. And if for some reason you have elevated uh, right-sided pressures, it can prevent that flap from closing completely. And so if it remains open, it's then called a patent frame in a valley. A lot of people actually have patent frame in a valley that don't, don't know about it. Um, and so we can see that with, like I said, diseases that cause elevated right-sided pressures. An ASD, however, it's not that that flaps open, it's that the tissue itself is not there. So it's actual lack of tissue that's causing the, the hole. And then we have a sinus venosis ASD, which is um, the next two are very uncommon in veterinary medicine, um, but uh, there are occasional case reports. But a sinus venosis ASD is in the dorsal or very top of the atrial septum, uh, where the cranial or caudal vena cava enter, and it, sometimes it can be associated with anomalous pulmonary venous drainage. So where the pulmonary veins, instead of draining into the, the left atrium like they should, they drain into the right side. And then you can also have what's called an unroofed coronary sinus. Um, basically, the coronary sinus opens up into the atria. So these are those different types. So again, the uh, septum secundum and septum primum are these two are the by far the most common ones we see in veterinary medicine. So this is the the um, primum ASD, so right at the lower part of the septum, and this is the secundum ASD, kind of right in the middle of the septum. And then these are your sinus venosis ASDs, and this is your little unroofed coronary sinus. So with an atrial septal defect, blood's going to shunt from the left atrium to the right atrium mainly due to the higher right ventricular compliance. So it's more of the ventricles that determine the, the compliance and the shunting. And over time that can result, if it's a large defect, can result in volume overload to the right side of the heart. So if you see this image, um, if you have an ASD, blood shunting from the left to the right side, so that blood goes into the right atrium, right ventricle, pulmonary artery, left atrium, right atrium, right ventricle, pulmonary artery. So your right side ends up seeing all the extra blood flow. So they develop right-sided overload or right-sided dilation over time. And they can also get pulmonary overcirculation again, because the lungs are included in that circuit of increased blood flow. Often have no clinical signs, just like everything we've been talking about. If their ASD is, is significant, then they can also have signs of right-sided heart failure, uh, which can be most commonly ascites in dogs and cats often pleural effusion. Occasionally we'll see cat with ascites as well. On physical exam, um, their ASDs are a little bit interesting in that you actually don't hear the murmur from the ASD itself. 
um, because the shunt's between the left atrium and right atrium, which are both very low pressure systems. And so if you're if your uh, left atrial pressure is 10 and your right atrial pressure is 5, the difference is only 5 millimeters mercury, which creates a very low velocity blood flow. So you actually don't hear the murmur um, from the shunt itself. What you can hear is what's called a murmur of relative pulmonic stenosis. And so because you have all this extra blood going into the right side of the heart, you have extra blood going across the pulmonic valve. And so that can create a heart murmur just from increased blood flow across the pulmonic valve, kind of like a physiologic murmur that we hear in other, other cases. And so it can be a left basal or systolic murmur. It can sound like pulmonic stenosis, but it's not true pulmonic stenosis. It's just due to an increased amount of blood flow across the pulmonic valve. So on echo, um, the different things we can see depending on what the ASD looks like. So um, this is a, a septum um, primum ASD where it's the lower part of the septum that's gone. And this is also considered what's called an AV septal defect. Um, and so your AV septum is kind of from the, the base of your ventricular septum up to your atrial septum. And so any part of that is it called, considered and also can be considered an AV septal defect. And then change nomenclature. There's lots of different ways to name different congenital defects. So sometimes it can, it can be confusing because there can be five different names for one thing. It would also be called an um, osteum primum ASD. And this is an osteum secundum ASD. So you can see it's in the middle part of the septum. So you have your lower part of the septum right here and you have your upper part of the septum, but then there's a large defect in the middle. And so this is just an image again of a big ASD. So another image, your left atrium, left ventricle, right atrium, right ventricle, and then your ASD right here, this would be a septum secundum ASD. So treatment for ASDs, uh, really it's medical management if they have right-sided enlargement or right heart failure. Interventional closure is an option. Uh, it's been reported in dogs. Again, one of those things that's not routinely done. There's only a few places that do them and it would depend on the location of the ASD whether it's amenable to uh, interventional closure or not. And then surgical closure is also something they would do in people, but it would require bypass in dogs and so not uh, widely available. So unfortunately not, as we continue going on, there's less and less we can do for these congenital defects. So it's mainly just medical management, uh, but thankfully we don't see ASDs um, very commonly. Moving on, mitral and tricuspid valve dysplasia. So dysplasia just meaning malformation of, of the valve leaflets. And so you can either have the malformation can either result in insufficiency or leaking or regurgitation of blood, or it can also result in stenosis of the valve leaflets or where they don't open fully. And uh, mitral valve dysplasia is also one of the most common congenital heart defects in cats. So uh, cats, we most commonly see, like I said, VSDs and mitral valve dysplasia, not as much PDA in, in VSD. And so with mitral valve dysplasia in cats, um, sometimes what we can see is uh, that results in uh, systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve or SAM for short. And so if you remember, um, what that is, is normally the mitral valve closes during systole to prevent backwards flow of blood through the heart. So in SAM, what happens is the anterior leaflet kind of flips backwards into the outflow tract um, during systole when it should be closed. And so obviously then the valve isn't open, and so they have uh, some degree of mitral regurgitation. So in a young cat, if we see any mitral regurgitation or, or SAM, a lot of times it is due to underlying dysplasia or malformation of the valve itself. That SAM, or the systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve, can then result in outflow tract obstruction, because if the valve's blocking the outflow tract, then it can obstruct blood leaving the left side of the heart, and sometimes they get secondary LV hypertrophy or secondary thickening. So it can be hard if you have a younger cat to know if they have thickening in SAM if it's primary HCM, then secondary SAM, or whether it's primary SAM with secondary HCM. So cats can be very, very tricky. Um, they're their own little special thing. And tricuspid valve dysplasia um, is one of the most common congenital heart defects we see in labs. So that's one, one breed we see tricuspid valve dysplasia in. Um, and if they're a breeding animal, they are supposed to screen or OFA. Um, their OFA requirement does, does require them to have an echo to screen for tricuspid valve dysplasia. 
but many other braids can also be affected. So we can really see, again, any braid with uh, dysplasia. I have a little patient that's a little pug with mitral valve dysplasia, so it can affect any animal. And then the severity is highly variable. So you can have mild dysplasia that may never affect the animal's lifespan, or you can have very severe dysplasia that results in volume overload of whichever side is affected. So if they have mitral valve dysplasia, it results in left-sided overload. If they have tricuspid valve dysplasia, it results in right-sided overload. Um, and so it really depends on how severe the animal is affected. Diagnosis, again, often have no signs or they have signs of heart failure depending on the side of the heart that's affected. So right heart failure, ascites or pleural effusion, left heart failure, pulmonary edema. And in my experience, a lot of these cases that are severe, um, usually that's how they're diagnosed is that they come in in heart failure. Um, and before that, they, they uh, didn't show any signs. On physical exam, if they have, uh, if the dysplasia is resulting in sufficiency or regurgitation, then they have a systolic murmur. So they'll just have a, a sound just like an older dog with uh, valve disease or mitral regurgitation. If they have stenosis, then you'll hear a diastolic murmur. And that's very, uh, very uncommon, but um, it is possible. So on echo, um, this is a, a cat that had mitral valve dysplasia resulting in SAM and secondary hypertrophy that resolved once we started treatment. So this is the initial echo and you can see it has left ventricular hypertrophy and then the, the um, kind of green blue is increased turbulence out the outflow tract from outflow tract obstruction and mitral regurgitation. And then the, once you started that cat on a beta blocker, so those are cases you usually use on a beta blocker to help reduce that SAM from occurring, and the hypertrophy actually uh, resolved in this cat. So this is a cat that had primary mitral valve dysplasia that resulted in SAM and secondary hypertrophy. So it looked like a cat with HCM, but once you relieved that SAM and the outflow tract obstruction, the hypertrophy then, then resolved. So usually when these cats first come to us, if I see a cat, a younger cat with this, you have no way to, of knowing if it's primary HCM or not, um, or, or secondary to mitral valve dysplasia. So we start them on a beta blocker, and then it depends on their recheck after how they respond um, is kind of what definitively tells us um, whether it's primary or secondary. And then this is a dog with tricuspid valve dysplasia. So the tricuspid valve is normally right here. So a lot of times what we see is that the septal leaflet, which is the leaflet right here, is not really formed. It's kind of just stuck to the septum. And so it doesn't even um, open fully. It's just kind of tethered to the wall. And so they obviously have severe tricuspid regurgitation. And this case has severe, severe right atrial dilation. So this is the little tiny left atrium. It's normally bigger or equal than the right. And so this is very severe right atrial dilation. So treatment, usually medical management for heart failure if present. If it's a cat, like I said, that has um, mitral valve dysplasia resulting in dynamic outflow tract obstruction or obstruction of blood leaving the left side of the heart, then we start them on a beta blocker. If they have stenosis or narrowing of the valve leaflets, you can do a balloon valvuloplasty for those cases, whether it's tricuspid or mitral. But again, that's very uncommon um, in veterinary medicine. And then surgical repair is also an option in some cases. So Colorado State University does do surgical repair for tricuspid valve dysplasia in dogs. And they're one of the few only places that does, um, but they've done several dogs with tricuspid valve dysplasia. So it is possible to repair. Um, it just would de highly depend on the case, um, whether they're considered a candidate or not. So moving on to Tetralogy of Fallot. Uh, this is one of my favorites, not because it's, it's not a good disease to have, but it's something that they teach you about that's supposedly not common, but I, I for some reason, was a magnet in my residency, and I've seen uh, more cases of Tetralogy than I would like to admit. And so Tetralogy of Fallot, just some history on it, uh, was first described a very, very long time ago. And then it was named after this guy right here who basically uh, described uh, these cases that had all these similar defects and were uh, what they called blue babies or they were cyanotic. And so he coined the term tetralogy of Fallot because he had these four defects that he, or four things he noticed in all these cases 
and of course he named it after himself. And if anyone's ever interested, there is a movie out there that's about the first surgery that was ever performed in babies with Tetralogy of Flow. And so it was uh, based on uh, two cardiologists, Dr. Blaylock and Dr. Tossig, who developed a shunt to basically get more blood flow to the lungs to help all these babies. So it is a good movie if anyone wants a little history lesson in cardiology and Tetralogy of Fallot. So tetralogy is uh, multifactorial. It has been proven to be genetic in Keyshawns. A long time ago, it was in a, a colony of dogs was um, proven to be autosomal recessive. I don't see a lot of Keyshawns, and most of the dogs I've seen with tetralogy are usually uh, mixed breed um, stray dogs. The genetics can certainly play a role. In people, there's lots of factors that have been proven to increase the risk. So a lot of things we don't have to worry about in dogs, like overuse of alcohol and uh, things like that. So what happens in tetralogy, um, interesting enough, it's, it's really one thing that goes wrong um, during their development that results in all these combination of defects. So I'm gonna try to show this video. This is what the heart looks like when it's developing. You actually have your it, one single tube that forms your aorta and your pulmonary artery. And so what you'll see is that the septum kind of forms down from here, and it does so in a spiral fashion, which results in the aorta and the pulmonary artery kind of being wrapped around each other. And then it meets up with the ventricular septum to close and result in two separate tubes, one coming off the right side and one coming off the left side. So all that happens in tetralogy, I'll pause it when it shows, is that this septum just forms a little bit too far to the right. The aortic pulmonary septum executes a spiral of 180 degrees and swings into line with the superior margin of the interventricular septum. It's crazy to me that that forms that way and results in, in the pulmonary artery and aorta kind of wrapping around each other. But this right here just forms a little bit too far to the right. And that's the only thing that happens that results in the uh, combination of defects we see with tetralogy. So like I said, all that happens is that septum forms just a little bit uh, too cranial, too far to the right. And what that happens then it results in malalignment with the lower part of the septum. And that results in the VSD or the ventricular septal defect and the overriding aorta and then the narrowed right ventricular outflow tract or the pulmonic stenosis. And then the narrowed right ventricular outflow tract, because it results in basically a pulmonic stenosis, then results in secondary right ventricular hypertrophy. And so this shows a normal heart, and then these are the combination of defects that make up tetralogy of flow. So you have your ventricular septal defect, you have your overriding aorta, which is kind of hard to see in this picture, but the aorta kind of overlaps to the right side. You have pulmonic stenosis, usually it's actually narrowing of the pulmonary artery itself, and then you get secondary right ventricular hypertrophy. So those are the four components of tetralogy. Overriding aorta, VSD, pulmonic stenosis, and right ventricular hypertrophy. So what happens is the pulmonic stenosis results in an increased pressure in the right heart. And it results in right pressure overload, which causes the right ventricular hypertrophy. So blood's always gonna take the path of least resistance. So when blood's coming through the right side of the heart, it's harder for it to go across the pulmonic valve out the pulmonary artery. So it's preferentially gonna be shunted across the defect into the aorta. So it results in right to left shunting of blood. So less blood's going to the lungs to get oxygen. And that results in often the clinical signs we see. So these animals are often cyanotic and they uh, commonly have exercise intolerance. They can have syncope episodes. Um, we can also see signs of right-sided heart failure. And then um, they're not really a clinical sign, but they're polycythemic uh, from their chronic hypoxia, basically. So prevalence, like I said, in dogs, it's not very common. It's only supposed to be 0.01% of congenital heart defects um, that we see. But like I said, for some reason, I have seen plenty in my um, short career. And cats is about 3% of congenital heart defects. It's also been reported in many other uh, species. So there's been reports of tetralogy, I actually had a case in my residency in a pig, uh, it's also been reported in ferrets, tigers, calves, beavers. So all sorts of animals have been documented to have it. And it's um, also commonly in, like seen in people. So if anyone knows who Sean White is, 
he had a tetralogy of flow um, and had obviously surgical closure and his surgeon must have done a great job because it hasn't slowed him down. Um, one of our technicians at work in internal medicine service actually has um, or had tetralogy as well. So it's not uh, too uncommon in people. So diagnosis in people, they often diagnose it in prenatal screening, but uh, post-birth, if it's for some reason missed, then they diagnose that similar to us, echo, um, if they're not pulsoxing well after birth and, and things like that. In veterinary uh, medicine, again, definitive diagnosis is usually made on echo. Um, there are reports of typical radiographic findings, and so this is what's described as classic tetralogy, is what's called as boot shape. So um, I guess it looks like a boot, and so that's what they call classic tetralogy in, in some radiology textbooks. But I, I, um, usually we still need echo to definitively diagnose it. So on echo, I apologize, this is kind of grainy. It's from my residency, but uh, this is the left ventricle right here. This is the aorta, and you can see that the aorta is kind of overlapping the right side of the heart. So the aorta is spanning both the left and the right heart. And you can see there's blood flow from the right to the out the aorta. So here's another image, still images. So this shows nicely this aorta that's kind of straddling both the left side of the heart and the right side of the heart. And of course that, that results in a ventricular septal defect because the aorta is kind of overriding. And then this is the pulmonic hypoplasia, the pulmonary annular hyperplasia. So the pulmonary annulus itself is narrow. So if you compare it to the aorta, this is very narrowed. Uh, which was resulting in pulmonic stenosis and that increased turbulent blood flow, that kind of green, bright blue color. So treatment, uh, really it's medical management. In people they would, and we'll talk about it, they'll do complete repair, but in, in animals are really uh, treating the symptoms. And so one of the most common complications is that they do develop polycythemia. And so we just do phlebotomies as needed to maintain their hematocrit. And so the goal is to be actually in the 60s we don't want to drop them too low because that can actually worsen their clinical signs. And so we uh, take their initial PCV and then there's a calculation of, actually on VIN that um, is pretty handy that you can use to calculate how much blood you need to remove. And then we, uh, after we remove their blood, then we give them about twice as much IV fluid back. This is a patient from my residency, Mitzi, um, that had tetralogy that we did periodic uh, phlebotomies in. We can also give them hydroxyurea. So if the phlebotomies aren't enough or they're requiring frequent phlebotomies, you can do hydroxyurea. And what that is, is it's an antineoplastic agent that causes bone marrow suppression, basically. So you're just suppressing the body from producing new red blood cells. Unfortunately, it's also gonna suppress other things. So they often have, um, they can get uh, neutropenic and um, leukopenic and, and other cytopenias. They can also have weird side effects like sloughing of their toenails and alopecia, and so it definitely is not uh, a benign drug, so it requires close, close monitoring. Uh, beta blockers have also been reported. Um, the main beta blocker is actually propanolol, and so that's a non-selective beta blocker. So what that means is not only will it act on the beta-1 receptors in the heart to decrease heart rate and contractility, but will also act on the alpha receptors in your peripheral vas uh, vasculature to cause vasoconstriction. And so the higher the systemic pressure is, it's going to reduce the amount of right to left shunting. Balloon valvuloplasties have been reported more of a palliative procedure to reduce pulmonic stenosis. So again, it's usually that the pulmonic, uh, the pulmonary artery itself is too small. So it's, it's usually not as effective, but it has been reported um, in, in dogs to buy them a few, few months. And then surgery is, again, how you would definitively fix it. There's different types of surgery. You can do full repair. So you're actually uh, going to close the VSD and then they do a graft on the pulmonary artery to actually make it bigger. This is what they do in people um, versus more palliative surgery, uh, which is the Blalock tussock shunt. This is the first procedure that they did. And so it basically is kind of creating a PDA. It's just creating a shunt to get more blood flow to the lungs, which would decrease their clinical signs. And so there are actually several reports of different surgical procedures done in dogs. Um, but still very uncommon. So it seems like, you know, years ago they did a lot more um, than, than more recently. They, they don't really do as, as much, um, but there are reports out there. So it's not um, unreasonable to, to, if an owner wanted to do everything, to look into some of the places like Colorado State or other uh, select institutions that do more open 
uh, open heart surgeries or um, procedures, it is something that they could uh, potentially do. And then prognosis really depends on the severity of defects. So sometimes dogs have tetralogy, but they're not that severely affected. Uh, so the aorta is not overriding that much or the pulmonic stenosis isn't that severe. And so sometimes their clinical signs are minimal. Uh, sometimes they're only a few months old and they have severe clinical signs. So it really depends on the animal. Also depends if they have any concurrent defects. And then if they did have something like a shunt, the Blalock tussock shunt or complete repair, they could of course have a, a fairly normal lifespan. That's just again, unfortunately not, not routinely done a lot of places. So then I'm just gonna go over some others very quickly, just mainly their cool pictures. There's lots of other congenital defects we see. And those are by far the most common. So these other things are just things that you, you may never hear about in your life, you know, in your career, but just interesting. So a complete AV canal is also called an AV septal defect or endocardial cushion defect. And so it results in complete uh, maldevelopment of the AV septum. And so, like I said, it's kind of the top part of the ventricular septum and the lower part of the atrial septum. And so it results in a single AV valve or single, um, basically, or mitral and tricuspid valve or just one single valve leaflet that covers, that spans both the left and right side of the heart. So here's a complete AV canal. So if you look at this animal, and so your, your left atrium and right atrium are uh, normally on, they're not on one plane. A lot of times the tricuspid valve is actually displaced a little bit apically. But you can see here that this is a atrial septal defect. So just the um, lower part of the atrial septum is missing. And then this is the ventricular septal defect. So just the ventricular septum is missing. And this right here is the complete AV canal. So you don't have the top part of the ventricular septum and you also don't have the bottom part of the atrial septum. So there's basically one huge hole in the middle of the heart and then you see this valve, just one valve leaflet that's bridging the entire heart. So this is what a complete AV canal looks like. So complete lack of AV septum resulting in ventricular communication, atrial communication, and one big valve leaflet. Another defect we can see is a double chamber right ventricle. And with that, um, there's a, an anomalous muscular bundle that crosses the middle of the right ventricle and kind of divides the right ventricle into two chambers. And so you have a proximal thickened uh, hypertrophy chamber, and then you have a distal low pressure chamber. And a lot of times we see a double chamber right ventricle with a VSD. And so this is what a double chamber right ventricle looks like. Um, this is the angiogram. So this is the right side of the heart. So this is a proximal chamber that's hypertrophied. And then you have this narrowing here where there's a muscular bundle dividing the right ventricle. And then the distal chamber is dilated. And so this proximal part is hypertrophied uh, because this muscular bundle results kind of in a narrowing um, in, the, in the middle of the right ventricle. So this part of the right ventricle has to work harder to get blood across that narrowing. And so it responds by getting thickened. And then the distal chamber is dilated just like any other post stenotic dilation. So it kind of divides the right ventricle in half. And then this little star right here showing that there was some blood shunting across the ventricular septal defect. So this is what it can look like on echo. So there's a couple images. I think this on the bottom shows it the best. So this is the left ventricle right here and the right ventricle is kind of a crescent on the top. And you can see this band of tissue in the middle of the right ventricle. So this is the double chamber right ventricle. And you can see the turbulent blood flow across that uh, membrane. Another interesting defect is called core tri triatum. And so you can have sinister, which is on the left side, or dexter, which is on the right side. And so sinister is, uh, core sinister is due to improper res resorption of the common pulmonary veins. And then dexter is due to persistence of the right sinus venosus valve. So both of them result basically in a, um, a membrane dividing the atria into two chambers. So this is core dexter, so on the right side. So you can see the right atrium right here is divided into kind of two little chambers. And here's another uh, core dexter. So you have your left atrium here, left ventricle, right ventricle, and then your right atrium is divided into two separate chambers. So there's this um, membrane that divides the right atrium in two. Um, and dexter is reported most commonly in, in dogs and sinister in cats, but we can see some overlap 
and it really depends on how the severity of whether anything needs to be done for it or not. Um, there are reports of if, if that uh, membrane is causing too much obstruction of blood flow, there are reports of going in and, and ballooning that membrane itself. It's more of a thin membrane, so it can be uh, opened up with, balloon, with a balloon. Endocardial fibroelastosis is a mouthful. Um, it's a rare congenital defect that basically results in thickening of the endocardium um, and results in a, basically a DCM phenotype. And unfortunately, it's uh, usually fatal um, in animals less than, less than six months or so. In, in kids, they would do a complete heart transplant, um, but in, in our animals, they don't have that option. And so this is actually an image from a, I diagnosed a family of tiger cubs with endocard endocardial fibroelastosis. So these are two tiger cubs that had this disease. And so what you see is the, the chambers, it's hard if you're not looking at gross pictures, but these are very dilated left ventricles. And then the endocardium, which is the, the kind of inside layer of the heart is very white and opaque. So normally it should be pink like the rest of the heart muscle, but it's very white. And so the bottom image is a histopathology. So this is normal myocardium, and then the endocardium is usually just a single layer at the top, this dark kind of um, purple. And so in endocardial fibroelastosis, what you see is that the endocardium is thickened. So from here to here is all the endocardium. And then some other things, so you can get complete transposition of the great arteries with or without a VSD. So complete transposition means that the Aorta is actually coming off the right side, so you can hear, see here, the aorta is coming off the right ventricle, um, and then the pulmonary artery comes off the left side. And so there needs to be a VSD for the animal to live for any length of time. If there was no VSD, then that would basically just result in two separate circulations, and that animal would, would not live after birth. And so uh, if there is a VSD, they, they can for some time, but uh, very uh, uncommon, but very interesting. Another thing you can see is called truncus arteriosus. So for this one, basically you still have that, like that video I showed about embryology, you still just have your one common truncus. So the truncus never equally divided into a pulmonary artery and aorta. So you have one truncus that originates it and leaves the left and right heart. And then usually after um, it's common, the common truncus for some time, and then it later branches into the um, aorta and pulmonary artery. So for this case, it's a, um, a after CT rendering, the truncus is right here, and then after it's kind of one single tube, and then it later branches into the aorta and pulmonary artery. And then you can also have another one as an AP window or aorto pulmonary window, and this essentially acts like a PDA, um, but it's just not a ductus arteriosus. So it's where you have a communication right here between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. So it results in the same, same physiology as a PDA, but it's not a ductus, it's actually opening right here, but results in continuous shunting from the aorta into the pulmonary artery. And then we can see various vascular ring anomalies. So there's uh, multiple different ones reported. And the most uh, common one that we probably think about is a persistent right aortic arch. So right here where you have your um, entrapment of your esophagus and kind of classic radiographic changes. And then some others, there's even more pulmonary atresia, double outlet right ventricle, persistent cranial vena cava. There's all sorts of crazy things that uh, unfortunately can happen during development. And most of these, we don't see that commonly in veterinary medicine, probably because a lot of animals, if they are severe or complex congenital defect, a lot of them probably don't live long after birth. And so we never see them. Um, but uh, when we do, it can be interesting. Throws us for a little bit of a loop. So with that, I will take any any questions. Question was why does subaortic stenosis predispose to endocarditis? And so as that turbulent blood flow um, goes from that, the subvalvular rigid tissue results in turbulent blood flow. It that turbulent blood flow basically strikes the aortic valve over and over again, and so it results in endocardial damage on the aortic valve, which then predisposes that if you have uh, bacteremia, it then gives that bacteria uh, um, substrate to lodge on. And so that's why uh, it predisposes to endocarditis is because that turbulent blood flow from the SAS damages the aortic valve. Versus like with chronic degenerative valve disease, there's actually no damage to the endocardium. Even though the valve's thickened, it's not the endocardium or the outside of the valve that's affected.
think that's it, Becky.